Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, to be with you and indeed uh, to explain um, the structure of the European budget. You know, usually we have a budget which uh, covers uh, different policy areas and uh, the usual magnitude is somewhere around, um, if I take uh, um, the, the usual size, uh, um, uh, 1,100 uh, billion uh, euro. Uh, for seven years in order to, to, to have a better understanding the traditional European budget is um, if I take only the annual one, um, less than half of the German annual national budget only to give a favor about uh, the, the magnitude because people very often confused about the fact we are talking about seven years and identify the seven years budget as an annual budget. Uh, so this is uh, something we were discussing already for more than two years. And now Corona um, has um, hit us and we have to respond to it. And therefore we have uh, made a, a number of uh, uh, decisions related to the um, response to this crisis. First already this year, we had to offer uh, a lot of liquidity and regulatory flexibility to our member states, which we have done. Uh, for instance, uh, we have already taken more than 200 state aid decisions since mid of uh, uh, March in order to uh, support. Maybe we can unmute yes. other microphones yes. because there's a lot of echo. Is it, is it possible that those who only listen uh, unmute their microphones? Well, I, I, I try to continue, even if it's not easy. So for this year, we have already provided a lot of liquidity altogether, different European institutions, 540 uh, billions and a lot of um, regulatory um, um, reliefs in order to help member states to accommodate with this crisis. And now on top, uh, we have to negotiate the new macro financial, uh, multi-annual financial framework for 2021 to 2027. And here uh, our proposal consists of what we call a core MFF of 1,100 billion euro for seven years. And on top, we have a next generation um, EU um, uh, facility, which consists of all together 750 billion euro, 500 billions in grants and 250 uh, billions, uh, up to 250 billions in loans. This should only be used in the first four years in order to have a thorough, quick, nevertheless, substantial response to the crisis. I was on mute. Um, thank you for setting out the broad outline. Um, Sorry, I, I have me? to say I can't hear anybody, but I have I hear many voices. Okay, maybe we can um, try and get anybody else. I can hear you now mute. quite well. Okay, I will continue anyway. Thank you so much for sketching out the broad architecture. Um, there are lots of different moving parts to this proposal. And we have a summit next Friday in Brussels where it seems that there will be a bigger overarching political discussion about some of the philosophies guiding next generation EU. And I want to 
the main ones, which is an issue about the recovery fund specifically and issues of governance. So you, I think you would have seen this week that the Greek prime minister pushed back at any attempt for a Troika style monitoring of the money that was going to be distributed to the recovery okay. fund. Can, shall I, um, can you hear Sorry, me? Sorry guys, this is not the way how we can communicate. Uh, People have to unmute the microphones. Mute, 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 not unmute, mute. Uh, mute, mute, sorry, mute. mute. We are hearing multiple voices. Right. Now, now it's better. Um, um, I can still Marine, come, come some back. murmurings, but I, I will, I will going to plow on anyway and just speak very loudly. Um, so some of the politics of the recovery fund, a big issue that has come up in the last 10 days or so is about the governance. And this yeah. is sort of less technical and it seems a lot more political in terms of different countries having different philosophies about what a recovery fund should look like. But in particular, what kind of governance should monitor or control the aid? Um, you saw the Greek Prime Minister and other southern capitals are very resistant to an idea that they could be subject to some sort of IMF or Troika style monitoring, whereas countries in more frugal capitals think that actually um, they need to have a tight level of uh, control and mechanisms to make sure the money is being used for deep reforms of these economies. Can you give us a sense of where the Commission's position is at and whether you think that this recovery fund has to be simply for investment, so for building projects and for having fiscal stimulus in a classic sense of a structural fund, where actually the money should be used to address deep rooted deficiencies in economies which the Commission you know, constantly assesses when it does country specific recommendations. Can you try and give us a sense of where you're positioning yourselves between these two camps? Um, yep. First of all, in the philosophy and also what you think the money should really be, be used for, thank you. Well, I, I think uh, uh, we have to distinguish between a lot of different instruments for different purposes. First, um, there, there was and there is a need to, uh, to provide liquidity to the markets, to the member states, business, etc. This is what we have done immediately and what we intend to do also in the near future. So we have some instruments, uh, uh, for instance, we use the remaining uh, pot of money in the current MFF uh, uh, in, in cohesion by lifting a lot of um, conditions enabling member states to use um, um, cohesion money for purposes which was not uh, which were not foreseen in the past for instance uh, uh, to finance um, um, uh, um, the, the health sector and everything which is related to it uh, to have purchases in the health sector etc uh and um, um we will have cohesion of course in the next um, mff there will be a significant advanced payment we will have react eu which is so to say in the spirit of uh, um, the the cohesion policy in terms of how it should be used but uh, this is an instrument which will only exist for the first two years in order to help countries repairing the damages of the current crisis. So we have uh, different instruments and I think a lot of liquidity uh, provided to member states in the immediate future and already today in order to serve these immediate needs. Uh, so this is the one side. And the other side is uh, uh, to draw lessons and to learn from what has happened. And we can see that uh, if there is a crisis, some countries are usually more hit than others, uh, usually always the same countries, those who are apparently less, less resilient. And this is why the recovery and the resilience facility should aim at uh, helping countries to recover, but also to build more resilience in order to be better equipped uh, in case there is another crisis. And therefore, this kind of uh, uh, um, um, providing money uh, should be seen also as a kind of investment, as an investment to prepare countries to recover more quickly, but also to be more resilient in the future. And in order to achieve this, we take the European semester as an orientation, if you like, as a benchmark 
to identify where the particular needs. And the European semester is something which is traditionally a result of a dialogue between member states and the commission to identify what are the needs, what are, uh, what should be the recommendations, and we can build on a lot of um, experience from the past. And uh, so this is something which is in a way a bottom-up process and not a top-down process, which is certainly a big difference to the famous Troika. Therefore, I don't see a big contradiction between what the Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis has recently said in an interview and what are, so to say, uh, the requirements, expectations, conditions, however you call it, of some uh, countries, in particular the frugal ones. I think we can reconcile the different ideas in a, in, in a, in a, in a concept, in an architecture which uh, fits into the different um, expectations. And this is uh, how I just explained it using the European semester, where traditionally member states uh, uh, elaborate on their own uh, what are their reform plans, and this then uh, will be approved by us. And uh, therefore, I don't see a big problem on this. Can you um, maybe sketch out the mechanism by which you will monitor compliance? Uh, will it be a system of milestones where a country either has to uh, pre-legislate something or go through a judicial or parliamentary process and then they would receive a next tranche of money? Will the recovery and reform plans that are submitted in autumn release the entire uh, allocation once the Commission has approved it? So, um, you know, can you just sort of sketch out, because this is a completely new and bespoke process which has never happened before, how you see the Commission's involvement two, three years down the line to ensure that the money has gone um, to the projects that it's been committed to and the governments are actually still abiding by their initial promises? Yeah, uh, for the Commission, it's not a, a totally um, uh, new uh, a procedure because we are doing this, for instance, in, in rural development, uh, in, 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 in cohesion policy, where we ask member states, where we have asked member states in the past to come forward with um, certain strategies, for instance, the transport sector in the promotion of the economy, etc., is a baseline for further programming and on basis of this uh, um, the, um, approval of uh, specific uh, projects uh, related uh, to this uh, uh, um, overall strategies. And uh, so they, in the spirit of this experience, we have proposed uh, this measure, which means that member states should come forward uh, <clears throat> within a couple of months after the um, approval of this uh, MFF with a national reform plan. And uh, this will be then discussed with the commission, finally um, endorsed by the council. It will consist of certainly uh, several milestones and we are still discussing the precise governance. I could, uh, for instance, uh, um, imagine that there could be a kind of advance payment, but further disbursements certainly have to be linked to the fulfillment of certain milestones. In that respect, uh, I think we can reassure those who want to see uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the necessary progress that this is, uh, so to say, possible. And on the other hand, uh, what we are, what the individual member states are working on uh, is something they are, so they identify on their own as a potential deficiency, a weakness, which they want to co correct. I personally would favor all these initiatives which are boosting, promoting the economy, uh, because at the end of the day, it's about more competitiveness, it's about more strategic uh, autonomy of Europe, it's about, uh, so to say, uh, better equipped also for global competition. And therefore, from my point of view, the focus in all this should be the economy. And maybe just a final follow up, and then I'll hand over to Zolt. But uh, in terms of the process, you say it's very much like cohesion, uh, the cohesion programs. Will the sanctions also reflect what is already uh, existing with structural funds. So if a country is seemed to be in breach of some of its commitments or even of treaty law, what would be the sanctions 
uh, under the recovery fund money that they would be subject to. In that respect, it's it's less uh, complicated or uh, let's say uh, uh, diversified like uh, it is in uh, cohesion. No, it, uh, it, it it simply um, um, so they, certain milestones have to be uh, met, and if this is the case, we can have uh, further disbursements. But this is uh, first and foremost, even in the interest of the respective countries, uh, even beyond um, the financial support they are getting from the European institutions. Sultan, I, I can almost not hear you. No. Sorry. I, maybe I, I maybe can't as hear we you. maybe as we get Zol's microphone, I will take the liberty to keep asking questions. Another thing that I did, should have mentioned at the outset for people watching is that you can also submit your questions in to the commissioner using Slido um, and the hashtag EU2020. And actually, this might be a good opportunity to jump in because we have a sort of related issue about conditionality. Um, Kathleen Halmai from Hungarian Press wants to know um, from the commissioner, she asks, how do you see the chances of the rule of law conditionality passing, taking into the account the opposition of the four Visegrad countries? So the idea that there will have to be unanimity in the final uh, process to approve the next generation EU. Do you think that the Visegrad are potential veto to getting this approved? I can only repeat uh, what I have uh, said in the past couple of days and weeks uh, several times um, in our revised uh, proposal of uh, 27 of May. We um, stick to our in, in here. We stick to our proposal of May uh, 2018. If it comes to rule of law, if it comes to uh, let's say systemic uh, deficiencies uh, in a given member state, which might have an impact on the um, uh, on the European budget, we we uh, proposed to um, uh, impose sanctions. Uh, which have to be, of course, uh, approved uh, by the European Council. Uh, and uh, here our proposal was that uh, the Commission proposal can only be, if you like, uh, changed or overruled by a reversed qualified majority. In the negotiation box of uh, Charles Michel of February, this reversed was deleted, uh, but we as a Commission still uh, stick to our proposal of May 2018 that there should be only a reverse qualified majority which could, um, uh, so say, overrule our decision. Thank you. I think Zolt's got a new microphone. And and by the way, I, I'm I'm confident if this is uh, again proposed that as uh, so a part of an overall package, it might uh, um, get um, so say it, it, it might be possible to, to get an agreement. And I know, by the way, that the European Parliament is very eager on this, and we should never forget. I mean, we are now very much focused <clears throat> on a decision uh, by the European Council, which is important, but so to say, legally spoken, uh, we, are, we are dealing here with a, a council mandate, which enables them to enter into negotiations with the European Parliament, of course, if it concerns the overall MFF, uh, we, um, they need only the consent of the parliament, but nevertheless, it will be a political negotiations between the two um, uh, decision makers. Thank you. No, I'm afraid uh, it's a very faint sound. So I might have to just take the liberty to keep going, but we are getting more questions in from the audience. So this is a good chance for to follow up. But we have a follow up from um, Jürgen, I've lost his question. Uh, Jürgen Matthias from the German Economic Institute wants to follow up on the idea of the semester. He says the European semester has proved to be rather a rather weak instrument. 
how will the commission deal with the political pressures to dilute the control of the milestones? So this is also, again, referring back to the process of dialogue. Sorry, Matilda, I think we can, we can hear you guys. So if you could mute uh, in the background, that'll be very helpful. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll carry on. So the idea that the, that the semester has not really proven to have any teeth, how, do you, how are you planning on giving it teeth, particularly now that it's become so politically important? Yeah, uh, so far it was about recommendations without any immediate consequences. But there was recently a report by the European Court of Auditors, and I have to admit, even to my surprise, the result was uh, better than I expected, uh, because uh, only 30% of all the recommendations were not um, um, uh, um, respected, and 70% of the uh, recommendations were either implemented or already under implementation. So I think finally, the picture is better than maybe the image of it. But now, of course, it should be part of an uh, so to say agreement about um, it should be a kind of uh, condition. And in that respect, I think um, uh, the instrument is much more, um, um, is, 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 is stronger than it was uh, previously, or it would be stronger than it was uh, maybe currently the case. I think um, I think Zolt still can't seem to uh, get connected. So one other big issue that I think we should touch on is the allocation criteria, which seems to have been a very uh, early objection from part of the council that the allocation criteria, as proposed in the recovery, does not reflect the true impact of COVID nineteen. Um, and today we saw the commission put out its forecasts on what it expects GDP in every member state to fall by in twenty twenty, and then any potential. 2021, you will have seen that Poland, um, I think by far and away, will have the shallowest recession of any member state in the EU, but will still be among the biggest beneficiaries of the recovery fund. I'm sure this is going to sort of embolden your critics who say the allocation criteria is not fit for purpose. Do you think now is quite a good, you have quite a good basis on which to reform this now, given that actually some of the economic data that's coming in is helping the Commission see where the economic impact of COVID is, and it should adjust its criteria accordingly. Well, <clears throat> first, um, I have to say it, it depends on uh, about which kind of program we are discussing. Uh, if it's about REACT EU, we will certainly apply a different um, um, allocation key, depending on the, on the needs uh, to help uh, member states to repair. If it comes on recovery and resilience facility, uh, very much uh, the, uh, let's say, the resilience um, capacity of member states um, have been uh, key parameters, uh, or the lack of resilience um, capacities have been key parameters for um, uh, the calculation of this key. Uh, but as my colleague Gentiloni rightly said, uh, no proposal will be a perfect one. Uh, you can argue this and that, and of course uh, many people are referring now uh, to forecast figures, and we are referring in our uh, so to say calculation on figures which are so to say hard figures, which are not the forecasts, which are not the so to say expectations, extrapolations whatsoever. But again, I think. <clears throat> um, nothing is cast in iron and we will see how things evolve and uh, of course we will have updated hard figures and here we can certainly modify in one or the other way the distribution key uh, but the, the, the general uh, let's say a baseline of it to focus when it comes to the recovery and the resilience facility was indeed to look into each individual country how the resilience uh, um, uh, quality of a given country is there. And this is also related to the situation in the past couple of years. So it's not only about the expectation, what would, for instance, uh, as it was, uh, or is the, so to say, a little bit the idea 
of the Visegrad countries, what would be uh, the expected growth, what, what would have been the expected growth rate this year, and what will be most likely uh, the decline this year, and the gap should then lead to the to the to the formula, etc. So um, there are different assumptions. Uh, we are focusing again on the on the resilience aspect uh, very much, uh, but of course there's also an opportunity, for instance, after two years to look into it and to see if certain modifications are necessary. But the main focus on the recovery and resilience facility should be to help countries to recover and at the same time to build um, their resilience uh, capacities. For other purposes, as I said, uh, repair and, and uh, quick support, we have different um, uh, calculations. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you repeat the last uh, the last two three sentences? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think you, your last sentence was a very important one. Well, I mean, <clears throat> as we usually say, um, the, uh, the, we are talking uh, about a symmetric uh, shock with asymmetric consequences. And in that respect, uh, we have tried to, um, to, to structure our financial support and usually poorer countries um, uh, are less resilient uh, uh, to crisis uh, than richer ones. And if we see in which way richer ones have immediately provided financial support to their business sector, if you like, uh, you see already the difference. And therefore, it is so important having in mind the functioning of the entire European single market that everybody is supported uh, in order to, to kickstart the economy, but also to recover as fast as possible, but at the same time, again, to build the necessary resilience. And we have member states, and these are uh, the richer ones, uh, which are more resilient than those who are uh, uh, the, the poorer ones. And therefore, we focus also very much when it comes to the recovery and resiliency instrument, also in the resilience uh, um, um, aspect. And, and this is why uh, so they, we have proposed this approach. And uh, uh, if I look at the 
reactions across Europe, uh, we are not so, uh, um, let's say, on the wrong uh, track, uh, because all the alternative proposals I have heard so far are very, very country specific, if I may not say tailor-made to the very specific interests of a given country. So I haven't seen a real alternative uh, concept. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, of course, there might be some, some discussions, but I think the general architecture is in a way um, not everywhere well received, but received. Yeah, I think uh, the the misunderstanding is a little bit that um, this is very much focusing on one specific instrument, and this is recovery and resilience. Uh, but we have other instruments, as I already referred to, um, the REACT EU, which should have finally 55 billions only for 21, 22. We have cohesion, which is significant advanced advanced payment. So we have different instruments where we provide payments, liquidity uh, already at the beginning of the MFF. And we have another instrument, recovery and uh, resilience, where of course the disbursement of money is linked to certain um, reform measures, to a reform plan, which has to be approved. And uh, this will, uh, it, it, for instance, in our proposal, uh, member states can can uh, uh, um, come forward, submit a reform plan uh, up to 50, up to 18 months after the agreement between Council and Parliament has uh, taken place. So I can only invite, and I know that uh, many member states are working already hard to submit such a, a reform plan much earlier and then of course there might be faster approvals and uh, uh, the whole uh, say program will be up and running faster and this might finally lead not only to earlier commitments but in case milestones are met also to much earlier disbursements disbursements and we're also discussing um, if there should be also advanced payments or not but this is subject <clears throat> to political decisions, but in, again, important is to distinguish between the different programs, those who are aiming at a quick uh, response, mainly to repair the damages where financial support is given, and others where we try to, so to say, learn our lessons to prepare ourselves for the future, to equip us better. So we have different programs for different purposes, everything quasi related to the experiences of uh, the current crisis. And by the end, uh, we should not forget, it's also about absorption capacities of different member states. All the public administrations are stretched to the extent possible and even beyond uh, how to, to deal with this crisis. Uh, I mean, uh, I told you, we have, for instance, taken more than 200 state aid decisions. So finance ministers, ministers of economy, et cetera, are um, so overstretched with workload 
uh, to, to implement all this. So uh, we have to, to take all this into a, um, account when we, or well, we took this all into account when we uh, proposed this architecture. So I think at the end of the day, we can guarantee a rather equal uh, uh, provisioning of money um, in order to help member states. Yeah. Um, just, uh, just, just only, before, uh, sorry, Commissioner. Um, it seems that Zolt's voice is still not heard um, on the live stream to the audience. Uh, the, they can hear the Commissioner and they can hear me. So I'll just summarise what that last question was. But the previous question was also about the ideas of early payments. And before that, you asked a question about whether there was an element of design in the allocation fund to make sure the poorer countries were getting more of the cash. So um, I might just have to repeat everything Zolt, Zolt's the audience can't seem to hear us so but i'll let the commissioner carry on and just try and fill the gaps in thank you very much uh, only uh, one or two sentences again on absorption uh, um, this is uh, certainly a problem uh, um, of um, from the past in the current situation and will be certainly also a challenge in the future this is why by the way uh, as part of this recovery and resilience facility uh, we also um, uh, propose a technical um, um, facility helping uh, member states uh, uh, to to prepare um, uh, mature projects in order to be quickly financed. So this we are fully aware about this on on resources. Um, of course, um, I mean we are facing an unprecedented situation, and we have to give an unprecedented uh, uh, response. I'm not now talking about. Uh, so the, the, the legal structure we have to apply in order to make it possible. But um, for the first time, not for the first time, but in terms of uh, the size, it's, for, uh, it's uh, unprecedented. We at least propose to borrow up to 500 billion uh, at the capital market by issuing uh, uh, bonds. And um, um, the question is how this should be uh, repaid. And actually, there are two opportunities, either to have um, at the later stage when the different bonds are mature, um, 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 higher national contributions, or uh, you introduce so-called uh, new own resources, which have the capacity uh, to um, repay uh, this uh, borrowing uh, at, the, at the later stage. And I don't see any appetite amongst member states to have now or even later higher national contributions. So the real alternative are new own resources, something, by the way, the European Parliament for different reasons has already asked for many, many years. And here uh, we, we have uh, proposed some uh, new own resources. It's not, if you like, an exhaustive list, but it's a uh, um, uh, and, um, it, it's about uh, the proposals which are under discussions and seem to have more support than others. Also, nobody is 100% happy, but it's for very different reasons. I want to go uh, not uh, in too many details, but only to describe quickly the four proposals we have made. I'm not referring to this uh, uh, levy for unrecycled plastics because this was already part of the discussions in February. But the other ideas is a 
a border capone um, uh, mechanism uh, to to compensate higher production costs of uh, products uh, being produced in Europe, uh, but with uh, sort of a uh, much more climate friendly technologies than maybe outside Europe. So this is what the reason why these products from outside Europe could be imported to Europe uh, cheaper than the same products produced in Europe. And here to have an equal level playing field is something uh, which I personally consider more than fair. Um, and by the way, is also trying to steer the global uh, behavior, behavior when it comes to pursue uh, the, the, the Paris uh, Agreement. Another proposal could be an extension of the ETS scheme, uh, even towards uh, uh, maritime and aviation. Uh, a third could be uh, because it's about also uh, respecting our political priorities, Green Deal, digitalization, fair taxation um, is um, a single market levy. I mean, it makes a difference if a big company is operating in the entire Europe, benefiting from the single market, a single, uh, if you like, rule book uh, in 20 countries, uh, uh, same currency um, um, and, and uh, no border controls at least in an ideal Europe. Uh, and uh, this makes a difference to a small company, which is maybe not exporting anything or only in one or two markets. So to use the benefits, uh, the savings um, uh, here to have a little, uh, so to say contribution is also something one could see as, a, as, as an issue of fairness. And the other, um, so to say proposal, the final proposal was uh, digital tax uh, or digital um, um, uh, so to say contribution, uh, which is uh, nothing else, uh, which is discussed uh, not only inside the European Union, but also uh, at the level of the OECD. Um, but uh, I mean, in the last couple of months, we have seen that uh, internet uh, companies have made additional profit, uh, which is okay. But on the other hand, we should not uh, uh, forget that many small uh, companies, uh, um, uh, shops have been locked down uh, and uh, um, uh, they usually have a bigger tax burden than uh, the international companies, which can, uh, so to say, use in a more flexible way, the best possible taxation um, uh, schemes. And uh, here also to compensate this, uh, um, the digital uh, tax is one of the potential options. But first and foremost, uh, it's important uh, to have an agreement about the overall amount which should be borrowed. And then we could uh, go into the, uh, um, into the next steps. Cool. Uh, I think we'll, we will try and take some questions, but I want to come back on the idea of resilience, because I think it's a very interesting word, which, uh, you know, maybe an economist would say has, has no macroeconomic relevance um, in terms of what it actually means. And it seems that a lot of the member states seem to think that resilience can mean very different things. So perhaps if you're a Spanish prime minister, resilience means that you spend money on green and digital priorities. But if you're a Dutch prime minister, resilience means that you have to reform your pensions system, your labor market and your taxation. What do you think? You seem to suggest earlier in the conversation that resilience is actually something a, a lot deeper. Uh, it's about a deeper level of structural reform in an economy. Can you just clarify just exactly um, the ambiguity around this word and what the commission really means when it says resilience? Yeah, uh, more on a general note, uh, we just uh, received the report of our fiscal uh, board and there they said that since 2014, the net investment has not increased uh, across Europe. And I think this is not a very positive uh, report and uh, it shows that uh, we have to change a lot of things. So we have to create a much more investment friendly climate and this will certainly boost the economy, will create jobs and will finally um, uh, uh, produce more resilience. Uh, I mean, resilience can be seen in very different, um, so say, um, um, 
realizations, if you like. Of course, <coughs> the, I used to give a very, I think a very impressive example uh, in order not to speak always about the, uh, the, the, the usual countries. Uh, it's about Croatia. Uh, Croatia is the country in Europe which is the most dependent one on um, income from the tourism sector. 25% of its uh, national income is based on tourism. And the next category of countries, in the next category of countries, we have uh, uh, countries like um, uh, Greece, uh, I think Portugal, Austria, where the share of tourism is um, around 14%. Uh, if it's about risk sharing, 25% is definitely too much. Uh, and uh, um, here, the answer should be not, of course, to reduce uh, tourism, but to boost the economy, to diversify the economy in order to reduce the share of tourism on the overall uh, national um, income in order to have a better risk sharing. I have seen it in my previous mandate when I was charged for the neighborhood, Tunisia, Egypt, one or two uh, terrorist attacks and for one or two years, uh, no tourism. And these are countries where tourism uh, even uh, played an even more important role. So this is, is a kind of vulnerability I don't want to see. And if it's about more resilience, uh, I think the aim should be in this specific case, again, to, to work on the diversification of the economy. In other countries, it might be something different, but what we see is definitely that Europe is an aging continent. Uh, we will certainly uh, uh, need more money for the pension system. The, the health system, as we have seen, is also something which might be more and more expensive. And we have to see how we can improve this kind of systems in order to make it um, affordable and still accessible to everybody, which is one of the big uh, achievements of Europe compared to other parts of the world. But again, I think the main focus should be on the economy, because if uh, the economy is not performing, uh, you cannot afford uh, to keep our living standard as it is. Thank you. Can you can you hear me, Commissioner? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I have a new equipment. Hopefully, also the audience will hear me now. So th there was a question on, on Slido on small and medium-sized enterprises. Namely, what are the, the specific elements of the next generation EU that feel particularly helpful for small and medium-sized enterprises? Leah. Uh, first, we have um, uh, um, uh, what we have just discussed, but on top of this, we should not forget we have our core MFF, our core uh, multi-annual financial framework, where we uh, offer a lot of opportunities uh, uh, for small and medium-sized companies, but a specific in, um, instrument, which is, uh, uh, um, uh, so say, precisely targeting SMEs, is InvestEU. Uh, InvestEU is uh, providing uh, primarily guarantees in order to make uh, necessary investments, but we do also a lot in terms of uh, research and in particular innovation. So uh, I'm always saying Europe is uh, financing the, the, the by far biggest public research program in the world, but we are uh, awfully uh, bad in transforming research outcomes into business cases. Here we have to see how we can improve this, but this is also partly, I would say, um, um, uh, a problem of mentality. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, unfortunately, if somebody fails in his uh, business activities, goes bankrupt, um, one is immediately uh, uh, stigmatized almost for the rest of his life. In, in other cultures, it's part of a final success story. I'm not sort of asking for failures, but uh, we should accept that if you try something, if you test something, you might fail. But important is to learn, to throw consequences, to try it again, 
to do it better, to do it differently, and then we will be successful. And this is something where I think we need also a, a kind of mentality change amongst ourselves, um, a, a stronger support uh, to those who, who try to go ahead, uh, take a risk. And um, um, so this is more on the psychological side, if you like, uh, on the social behavior side, but also we have to offer, um, if you like, uh, more venture capital. Um, Europe offers two less uh, venture capital. Uh, here we are rather weak compared to the United States. Most of our companies are financed by the banking sector, 80%. Uh, banks are, per definition, risk averse. Uh, and therefore, it's a huge handicap for startups, for the development of uh, um, uh, companies, etc. I think here we have to make changes. I think also here the union, uh, the union with its budget, could uh, spearhead uh, changes and uh, and for this, for instance, InvestEU could be quite an interesting programs for startups, for SMEs, etc. Good. Thank you. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm just asking for sure because fortunately there were some some technical problems. Now, let me ask you a question about the timeline. Uh, I mean, none of us has a crystal ball, so we don't know whether the European Council will endorse any compromise next week or not. But my question is that if there will be an agreement next week. Do you think that the rest of the year will be sufficient to put in place all other legislation so that all programs can start on the 1st of January next year? And on the contrary, what risks you see that if there is no agreement next week, then uh, is there a risk that the programs will be delayed similarly to the, to the current 2014-2020 multi-annual framework for which the agreement was reached just late 2013 and and simply many projects, programs couldn't start uh, from 1st of January 2014. So how do you see the timeline depending on whether there is an agreement next week or not? Short, you have already given the answer. Uh, I mean, if there is no agreement next week, uh, we will certainly run into difficulties uh, exactly for the reasons you have described. Uh, I mean, when we presented uh, more than a month ago, our revised budget, um, uh, it was accompanied with uh, 22 um, uh, legal proposals, um, and uh, this has to be negotiated. And we are definitely uh, already in in serious uh, time constraints. So I hope, and I I, I can only uh, urge all the leaders uh, to get an agreement. What I sense is that. Uh, in particular, the German presidency is rather eager to get an agreement. And I, uh, today I will talk to, to five finance and European affairs ministers, or partly I have already uh, talked to them. Uh, there is, from the different parts of Europe, uh, uh, for different reasons, but the same interest to get a deal. I hope uh, things are well prepared so that indeed we can reach a deal. And I think it's also an important signal to our citizens that in such uh, a huge crisis, economic crisis, first it was a health crisis, now it becomes more and more an economic crisis, or it is already an economic crisis. Uh, people expect that uh, politicians can take decisions and also the markets need, uh, so to say, trust and confidence. And uh, I think there's a spiral Either it's an upward or it's a downward spiral. If there is no confidence, no hope, no perspective, people won't uh, uh, consume. And if there's no uh, uh, so say private uh, consume, there is no uh, investment. And uh, uh, if, if the investment doesn't pick up, uh, we, we might face serious problems uh, in, in the economy. So therefore, we need a strong signal by the European Union, uh, by the European leaders, that uh, they are able to take decisions and 
by taking these specific decisions, they provide the European institutions and therefore the European citizens finally with the necessary financial firepower to be well prepared uh, to, to sort of say, make decisions and to be prepared for this current situation, but also in case which we hopefully will not um, uh, so say face if there's a second wave. We have to be also prepared in financial means to, to, to deal with such a new additional challenge. I hope we are now better prepared and there are many indications and proofs that uh, Europe would be much better prepared if there's an upsurge of uh, infections. Uh, but you never know, and it's good to be also financially uh, well prepared. And also for this reason, we need a decision so that people can really enjoy their holidays and uh, return healthy back from the holidays uh, to to be fit and and ready to take all the challenges in autumn. Uh, well prepared, and also for this reason. Really? I'm looking at my watch and I think we've actually um, run out of time, but that's a very good um, note to end it on. Yeah. I'm sure myself and Zolt will be following um, the council and maybe the next few weeks and okay. hopefully not August, um, but we'll see whenever this does get resolved, but we'll be following it very closely. So um, I think my last task is to say thank you very much for joining us. I apologise to everyone on the stream and also to the commissioner for some of the technical difficulties. I think there were some gremlins that you could you could hear earlier on but i think we managed to fix them in the end um, so um thank you uh, once again and, and good luck with it all thank you and um, thank you commissioner good afternoon thank you very, thank very, much. Much. Thank you. very interesting discussion thank so you very much i think there were some problems that you could you could hear earlier on but i think we managed to fix them so uh, thank you uh, once again and, and good luck with it all Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I think there were some problems that you could hear earlier on, but I think we managed to fix them. So uh, thank you and uh, once again and um, good luck with it all. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I think there were some problems that you could hear earlier on, but I think you might have some questions. So, 